Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Illinois live stream and podcast. I'm Patrick Fingston. I write the Illinois political newsletter. It's inboxes daily on issues surrounding state government and politics. You can find our stuff every day at theillinois.com. Uh, we haven't been here in a couple of weeks with Thanksgiving two weeks ago and veto session in Springfield last week. So it's nice to be back with you today. Coming up on our show, we'll speak to the incoming Republican leader in the Illinois House, uh, Representative Tony McCombie. Uh, she has a tough job on her hands with a caucus and a super minority that's legislatively irrelevant, uh, that doesn't raise any money, and has a GOP brand in the suburbs specifically that's that's toxic. We'll chat with her in a, a few minutes. First, though, now that the General Assembly passed changes to the law eliminating cash bail in the state January 1st, uh, when, when it... it uh, takes effect January 1st during veto session. Uh, it, it's not like we're going to have a holiday season of, of yuletide and good cheer in state politics. Instead, we're we're getting a new battle, uh, this time over guns. Uh, on, on the final day of veto session last week, Democratic Rep. Bob Morgan, who uh, represents Highland Park, uh, where a young man um, with an AR-15 style rifle killed uh, eight people injured dozens more during a, an Independence Day parade uh, in in Highland Park. And uh, it's 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 obviously been an issue that's at the top of many, many people's minds since uh, since July 4th. So uh, the assault weapon ban is is going to be the the main topic of conversation over uh, over the final few weeks of of the year and into the the lame duck session that that we run into uh, in early January. So, what's in the bill? Uh, essentially, it it bans possession or purchase of any kind of semi-automatic rifle you can think of. Uh, it would also require registration of existing rifles. I put the the list in the newsletter the other day, and I don't have time to go through every single one of them on the list with you. But but if you can think of it, it includes it: AR-10s, AR-15s, AK-47s, Barrett 50 cal's, which I don't think have ever actually been used in a crime. Bushmasters, Ruger folding stocks, uh, and the the Smith and Wesson uh, M&P 15, the actual weapon used in the Highland Park killings. Uh, M&P, by the way, stands for military and police. It, it also raises the age to get a FOID card to 21 in most instances and bans handgun magazines larger than 10 rounds. The Glock 19, which I believe is the most popular handgun in America, comes with a 17-round standard magazine. So it would, it would impact a lot of, uh, a lot of weapons. Democrats, I would say, are expected to move this legislation during the, the lame duck session. Uh, they'll need fewer votes to pass the law than, than they needed, say, like last week to pass the Safety Act because of uh, the new year. They'll just need the 60 votes in the House and 30 in the Senate. But I also wouldn't expect this to be like the concealed carry uh, negotiations that, that came about a few years ago. Uh, this, this isn't going to be a negotiated legislation. Gun groups and Republicans are not going to be at the table, even if they were invited. Uh, I talked to Todd Vandermeid, who's a, kind of a, 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 a pro-gun expert, former NRA lobbyist, uh, retired NRA lobbyist. He said the other day, uh, the gun owners of this state have played nice and played by the rules. No matter how law-abiding we are, it's never enough. There are no more negotiations. Pass the most god-awful piece of legislation you can, and we will see you in court. Gun rights supporters are confident that they can beat back any eventual legislation because of a recent Supreme Court ruling, uh, which was the uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, uh, B-R-U-E-N, if you want to Google that. Uh, that ruling struck down... Uh, essentially extensive limits on concealed carry legislation and called into question the future uh, of any uh, gun control legislation. 
couple of things worth mentioning here. Uh, the majority of gun crimes in this state, whether it's it's the city of Chicago, whether it's Champaign, whether it's the suburbs, or anywhere else, are perpetrated by handguns. Assault rifles are notable. Uh, you know, they're 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 big news, especially Sandy Hook, Highland Park, etc., Ubalde, etc. Uh, they they look scary. They 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 shoot a, a larger size round, uh, but but in terms of the frequency of crimes, the number of crimes being committed, those are are clearly being perpetrated by handguns. Two, um, and you hear this a lot from from gun rights folks that that the laws on the book need to be better enforced. Um, and there are examples of that where it's true, uh, specifically in Cook County, where, where Kim Fox seemingly doesn't prosecute anyone for anything. Um, and, and somebody can get, get arrested with a gun and be out, you know, without bond, essentially the same day. Um, but even in a place like you know, I, I go back to Champaign County a lot because I, I know the state's attorney there and, and have, 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 you know, used to cover crime in Champaign County. And, you know, they have a hard time when someone gets arrested getting a conviction because no one's going to testify against them. So it's essentially, you know, uh, impossible to put together a case. And, and that doesn't help trying to prevent gun crime. That doesn't help trying to uh, limit the, the issues that, that, that face um, the state, that, that face you know, these communities, so that, that it, it's almost impossible to, to keep someone locked up, even though you know they did it, because there's, there's no one who's willing to, to snitch. Uh, and third... You know, I think, you know, and, and I, I'm a downstater. I grew up with a, a closet of guns that, that was literally there when you, you open the front door to walk into the house on the farm that I grew up. So I, I'm, I'm different than, than I think a lot of people, especially suburbanites that, that, that issue that, that pay attention to this issue, but, but also you know, I, I recognize that that there's an issue here, and I think most people with um, common sense see that there's an issue there. That you know, yes, it takes someone to to pull the trigger, you know, eighty times or however many of the shots the kid in Highland Park took. But you know, there. I don't know that there's middle ground on this. There's surely something. I mean, there has to be something to help keep guns out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them. And, and we don't necessarily know the right answer there. But but extremes, whether it's, you know, a gun in every hand or banning all guns, aren't 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 going to make things safer, aren't going to make things uh, better tomorrow. It might make you feel good. It might make some suburban suburbanites feel better about themselves. But is that going to impact crime in Chicago? Is that going to keep people safe? I don't. I don't know that that an assault weapons ban does. But that said, how do we keep guns out of the hands of this this punk in Highland Park, or or the the guy in Uvalde, or the the guy in Aurora a few years ago? I, I don't know the answer, but I wish more people were having realistic conversations about how to fix the problem instead of just locking themselves into their their corners. Uh, and and you know this issue is is way too important. And and I hope that we can find find some middle ground as we move forward. But we'll be following this and. Uh, hopefully have more for you over the next couple of weeks as we uh, lead toward uh, lame duck session right after the first of uh, right after the first of the year. We are pleased to be joined by the incoming Republican leader for House Republicans uh, in the new General Assembly. That's State Representative Tony McCombie, a Republican from Savannah on the far 
uh, northwest side of the state uh, on the Mississippi River. Uh, Representative McCombie, uh, soon to be Leader McCombie, uh, welcome, congratulations. How, you know, you threw your hat into the ring to be leader two years ago uh, after kind of a disappointing track for Republicans. How did things shape up this time for you uh, to, to, one, throw your hat in the ring and get things lined up for you? Well, I certainly had no intent of, of, of running, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, this year, uh, we were in uh, Burr Ridge in, over, over election night, and really just to, to be there to be supportive and to help. You know, as you know, you've done campaigns before. We sit there and log in numbers as they're coming in, and we all have our areas that we're working on to help staff. So really, that's what we were there for, and, and to start talking about how we go forward with Leader Dirk. And unfortunately, with the results of the evening, uh, Leader Durkin decided that he wasn't going to run again for leader, uh, which was, uh, I'm sure, a very hard choice for him to, to make that decision. And it just kind of really snowballed from there. I called my husband first thing in the morning, and my second call was Noreen Hammond from Macomb to see if she would be uh, my deputy leader and help me with this. So um, really, that's how it started. And as you know, uh, you just start calling members right away. Uh, and explaining, you know, what your what your thoughts are and kind of giving your resume, what your plans are. And that had to kind of really be thrown together pretty quickly. Uh, hadn't changed much on my thoughts from the year before, but then I was the um, House Republican uh, Organization's chairperson. So it was more politically driven where this year or this cycle, um, it was a combination of both the official side and the political side of changes that I would like to see made. What happened in this election cycle to Republicans? I mean, there's a laundry list of things that that played a role, whether it's whether it's Trump, whether it's gerrymandering, whether it's fundraising, whether it's Darren Bailey at the top of the ticket. Is is there anything you can specifically pinpoint that 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 killed Republicans in in Illinois this election cycle? Boy, if I could pinpoint the exact, I think I'm in the, the in the wrong business and I should get into political consulting. You, you know, Democrats didn't win the cycle because they were winning on the issues for crime and, infl and inflation and corruption, that's for sure. All those things you just mentioned certainly affected voters differently across the state. And it, it's, it's what's important to them. Um, so the thing that we need to do as Republicans is to make sure regardless of, of how we're feeling and if we're uh, feeling discouraged that it doesn't stop us from going to the poll um, to embrace voting um, and to just show up. Lots of times, uh, and, and I can speak from not only my area, but whether it's the suburbs or even in Chicago, the many friends that I have there, we would oftentimes, uh, if we get upset, we just say, forget it. We're just not going to go. My vote doesn't matter. Uh, and that's where I've worked really hard within my district. And in my district, I, I believe has seen that, has seen that, that their voice does matter. And the way to do that is to show up regardless of how many people might vote in, in Cook County or another County, we have to be present as well. And I think that's, that's really important. And we have to show Republicans that um, we am, we do embrace all people. We are the party of the big tent. How that stopped being our media message is uh, disturbing to me. But but is I mean is it is it the big tent party? I mean I, I I've gotten into shouting matches when I've filled in on radio shows over the last couple of years with with Republicans, you know, whether it's rank and file or whatever that that are you know anti-immigrant or, you know, have, have terrible vitriolic things to say about people who are, who are coming here when, when we've all, we've all come from somewhere or, you know, the way that, that, that Republicans talk about people who see the world differently, gay, trans, etc. It, it, it seems as if, you know, there are, there's a section of the party that talks about a big tent, but there seems to be a larger part of the party that, that doesn't want to welcome people who are different than them in. How do you balance those two uh, differing competing factors within the GOP? Well, one, I, I disagree. And I would say that Democrats uh, feel the same way or say the same things and have different viewpoints um, across all of those boards as well. 
the the problem with with being a, a Republican or being a Democrat is, is just that um, walking doors. And when someone says, uh, "Are you know, I'm a, I'm a Republican because I'm pro life," well. It shouldn't be a one issue that that makes you a Republican or a conservative or a liberal or a Democrat. It, it's a combination of things, and how you how you treat people like they're humans is an important thing. Now, I, I will certainly you know stand up and speak out against any person of any party when they come at folks uh, in that way. I, I think social media certainly has not helped. Uh, with how people uh, talk to each other. And, and my my advice to anybody that's watching this and my ask is, hey, if you're not willing to have that conversation with them and, and say it that way to their face, then please don't say it on social media um, because that divide is going to continue. And keep in mind, Patrick, that there are people, there are groups, there are um, advocates that want to keep that divide because if there's no divide, if there's no primaries, there's a lot of people in this business that don't make money, and that's a big problem. But but there is a, a geographic part of this too. I mean, you're you know I'm I'm a downstater even though I live in the suburbs now, and and you know work downstate congressional races and and legislative races too. And you're you know even though it's it's still northern to most of the state, it's still kind of considered downstate. But the 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 real divide whether it's issue based or not is clearly around Donald Trump. I mean we have to we have to admit that, right? That that he is the most popular figure that Republicans have seen downstate at least since Reagan, um, but is completely toxic in the suburbs. And and the numbers have proven that and Trump has lost Illinois by a million votes twice. How do you move the Republican Party past all of the controversy, all of the toxicity, especially in the city and suburbs of Trumpism without alienating your core constituency downstate. I respect, Patrick, how people vote. And there are people in the suburbs, there are people in Cook County, all over the state that vote for uh, our leaders uh, because they're at the top of the ticket. It, there's lots of times, unfortunately, even in our small races here uh, across the state, sometimes you, you, know, you plug your nose and you vote. Uh, but that's the important thing is to vote. We as Republicans, um, like I had stated, we, we need to be reaching out to our common sense voters. We need to be reaching out to people that maybe we normally didn't in the past. And, and I don't know why that is or, or why that stopped. Uh, we need to reach out to, to women and young voters, uh, people that have like-minded uh, thoughts and issues to us. Sorry, my light keeps going out here. Um, but Illinois by far, and I think you do agree, could be the best place, and I believe it is the best place to live, um, but it could be better. I mean, here we have um, just today um, in the newspaper, our local school district going to be uh, doing a, a hearing to raise taxes again. Savannah in my current legislative district is the highest tax rate um, within my legislative district. And, and why is that? Because people are continuously leaving. We, we have the ability to really embrace really good policy um, and still support um, our most vulnerable, still have projects, still do all these things. But for some reason, our folks, uh, I would say, and more of the urban areas won't embrace those things. And pretty soon uh, they're gonna realize that they're gonna have to do that as well. Uh, I hope sooner than later. Uh, that Those are the things we need to be talking about. I, I think we have to talk about money though. I mean, right, that, that sure. Republicans are at a gigantic fundraising disadvantage, not not just because of the money that J.B. Pritzker can personally dump into to legislative races, but but the the union money that dumps in the the way that the Democrats and and the machine that they built to raise money swamped your candidates. I mean, at one point there were thirteen House Democrat candidates on Chicago broadcast TV and zero House Republican uh, candidates on Chicago broadcast TV uh, in the waning days of, of the campaign. That that makes a that makes a huge difference. So. 
how do you fix the fundraising apparatus that has been so broken uh, for Republicans since since Bruce Schrauner kind of pieced out a few years ago? Yeah, and, and I think uh, the Democrats, as soon as Governor Pritzker is gone, will also uh, run into some issues with their their fundraising as well. Uh, but that being said, I don't want the Republican Party to rely on one or two or three donors. I, I want the Republican Party uh, to rely on the voters who who vote. Um, those that are giving the $5, the $20, the $50, the $1,000, uh, those that are investing. One of, one of the problems that Republicans do uh, is that we have several different organizations that are raising money for their organization that they say is going to promote and support Republican candidates. Well, we need to work together and bring all of them together because the money's being split in so many different ways that it does make it hard uh, for us to have a consolidated effort. So so that's, that's one. We need to get the small donors and we need to get all of our um, advocates and, and partners who say they support Republican candidates working together to actually support Republican candidates and then also attract those large voters. We are also uh, in this next cycle, we will be very targeted. Uh, we had a, we had a great cycle when it came to the the number of Republicans on the ballot, uh, but we we did a lot of that on a state level, and that's that's really in, in in my opinion that's not our our job. We need to be relying on our counties, and the the counties um, need to be realize they need to realize their value and how important it is for them to help us with candidate recruitment, candidate fundraising. Um, and candidate work. Uh, so we're going to go at it a little bit differently this next cycle that I, I hope we won't need uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars because we will always outwork um, our, our opposing Democrats. That's for sure. So you're going to take office uh, as, as leader, you know, in, in early January uh, with a, a smaller Republican caucus than than has been there, at least since the cutback amendment. Um uh, and, uh, you know, you're the, the first downstate speaker or Republican leader since, since George Ryan was speaker in uh, 1982, and he's from Kankakee. So it's not like he's even downstate. I mean, if you, ha you have to go back to the 60s to find a real downstater. Um, you know, how, how do you, you know, and obviously, you know, in the first woman in the job too, leading the Republican uh, caucus in the the House, and and I worked under Chris Redonio in the Senate when when she was leader. So you know, I'm I'm uh, I actually reached out to her when when you won the won the race and and said any you know any advice you would give her, and she's like, it's not a gender thing, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, she just needs to get organized and work hard, and and. Uh, so I'm sure you would say the same thing on gender, but how do you how do you take all of those things that that I mentioned, whether it's, you know, lack of members, you know, the the smaller caucuses, the Chicago footprint, et cetera, et cetera. And how do you make Republicans relevant in today's legislative environment? Well, it certainly is going to be a challenge. It's a it's always a challenge when the Democrats have the majority, regardless if we have 40, 45 or or, or 50. Uh, so we'll continue to uh, reach out and work um, with Speaker Welch. I, I, I have not spoke to Speaker Welch as of yet. Um, he did uh, reach out and left me a message uh, congratulating me and that we would be discuss We would be talking over veto, but I haven't heard from him yet. But I, I hope that we will uh, very soon be having conversations. I, I'd like to hear their priorities and I'd like to him to hear our priorities and, and exactly how do we have a seat at the table. Patrick, they don't need one vote from us for anything, but that doesn't mean I don't want us to have conversations with them um, about important issues. Republicans are no different than um, others in the state. You know, we we are supportive of public education. We're supportive of, of working people. We're we're supportive of serving our most vulnerable through our social services. We're supportive of of lowering our taxes. These are all issues that we should all share. It's always how do we get there, and I am I'm. People that know me know that I'm not going to just sit down and, and sit back in a room and, and wait to be asked to be part of the conversation. I will demand a seat at the table. And and if I'm not getting that seat, Patrick, you'll be you'll be one of the first to know. 
and I'll, I'll let you go on this, uh, representative that, you know, you, you kind of lead me here where there are two competing, uh, thoughts of how Republicans should act in the legislature. There's the, uh, you know, Jason Barrickman's on his way out. So I think there's a, you know, his, his style of go to the table, make what he considers bad bills better. He put his vote on gay marriage. He put his vote on, on the marijuana, uh, legislation that he was at the table and worked at. And then there's Darren Bailey who stood up and said, we need to be the, the loyal opposition that doesn't take part in any conversations and essentially just votes no on everything. Mm -hmm. Um, how, you know, who's right in, in this and how, you know, how do you approach how Republicans move forward, especially because Democrats have shown they don't necessarily want to give you all a seat at the table? Yeah, it, it was disheartening to, to hear on the Senate side that the answer was no, there would be no seat on the table when it came to the Safety Act. We, we didn't have a seat at the table either, but at least uh, the speaker didn't come right out and just say no. Uh, that, 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 that is somewhat encouraging. I've talked to a lot of folks. As you can imagine, my phone is ringing a lot. Uh, and I would say more, more right-wing, um, conservative um, even libertarian organizations um, and people in general who are asking that exact same question. But um, I cannot represent the people of my district or the state, nor can any other representative um, if they are not at the table just to sit, sit on the House floor or to sit on a podcast or to get on social media and just um, say no, 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 without having compromise, that is not serving your district. And, and people need to realize in, in our districts, we have folks who are not registered to vote, that are not Democrats, that have different issues and concerns. And although we were elected by Republicans and some in their districts are, are elected by Democrats, we in our state positions and our official side still have to serve all of the people. And if there are representatives or senators in office today not willing to do so, then I suggest they don't run. House Republican leader designate Tony McCombie, uh, Republican from Savannah. Uh, representative leader, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, best of luck to you. And I'm sure we'll uh, we'll talk often and, and hopefully uh, uh, see you soon. Uh, around uh, around Springfield and uh, hope to, to see what, what happens next. Uh, I look forward to see what happens next as well. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. That's uh, incoming House Republican leader, Tony McCombie, uh, who has a big job ahead of her as, as she uh, tries to uh, get things um, moving in Springfield for, for Republicans. Uh, it was a, a really rough, legislative uh, or uh, election cycle for for specifically House Republicans. And she has to build a fundraising operation from scratch, essentially now, and and, and try and uh, recruit candidates and, and win races that they haven't been winning in, in the last few years. So uh, it'll be a tough job for her, not even just on the leg or on the legislative side, trying to have a, a seat at the table or or make Republicans relevant uh, in in Springfield when they they haven't been uh, much at this point anyway. Uh, but but then there's the political side on top of that. So uh, thanks to to Leader Designate McCombie and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from her and seeing how she uh, does things over here uh, in the next uh, few weeks and months. Thanks so much for, for taking time to, to join us today. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, let us know what's on your mind. Drop us a note anytime at mailbag at theillinois.com. Uh, and uh, let us know what, what you think, what you want to hear, what you want us to talk about. We're, uh, we're trying to, to present uh, conversations and, and people and, and interesting uh, uh, discussions that, that we hope are interesting to you. So uh, we want to hear from you as we continue to... Uh, build out through the rest of this year and into uh, into 2023. So thanks so much for joining us. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon on The Illinois.